Wise and Jerry Kulkarni, uh, who's a fourth year medical student uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, she's the National Officer of Reproductive and Sexual Health uh, with the Canadian Federation of Medical Students. Uh, she used to be the co-president of the Medals of Students for Choice at the University of Toronto. So first of all, thank you to Carolyn, Mary, and Stephanie for your wonderful talks. And also thank you to the organizers of this event for inviting me and including me on this panel full of such amazing, accomplished women. Um, my involvement with the Canadian feminist movement began relatively recently <coughs> compared to my co-panelists. But I've already had the, the pleasure of working alongside feminists from all walks of life including some of our panel members here, including Carolyn. I've learned a great deal from them throughout, and I continue to do so during my own involvements with the feminist movement. When I first started medical school, abortion had been decriminalized in Canada for 24 years. In fact, I've actually never lived in Canada or actually been alive at a time when there were abortion laws in Canada. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Like many of my peers in medical school, I've never experienced a time where it was considered common for women to be hospitalized with major complications of illegal abortions. The stories of the illegal abortions were told just like that, as stories. They were things of the past. It was really hard to imagine, and still is really hard for me to imagine, having entire obstetrical wards dedicated to complications of septic abortion. But that was, in fact, the reality for many years. I knew before entering medical school that I had an interest in women's health, and in particular in reproductive and sexual health. And I look forward to pursuing my medical education at University of Toronto, a leader in medical sciences in North America, a large research institution, home to some of the biggest names in medicine, and a large level of sexual and reproductive health clinics available throughout the city, where I'm sure many students would be able to learn at. I never thought I would gain anything but the most comprehensive teaching possible about abortion, especially being a quarter of a century out of the Morgan Tyler position. Wow, I was wrong. <laughs> In my entire four years of medical school, we've had four hours of the entire curriculum dedicated to abortion. And in those four hours, we had one hour that was devoted to a presentation from a lawyer who provided a great history about the laws of abortion in Canada and how it came about to be decriminalized. Followed by this, we had two hours of small group ethics seminars where we reviewed cases to discuss the ethics of abortion with our classmates. These cases involved women who, wa who had wanted pregnancies and unfortunately had medical conditions that made pregnancy dangerous for them or pregnant women who were diagnosed with fatal fetal anomalies that were not compatible with life. You probably noticed there was a certain case missing from this, which were the cases about women, a woman who was pregnant but didn't want to be. We, we didn't hear anything about them. Following this two hours of ethics talk, we had a talk from a panel of experts on conscientious objection. This was a panel consisting of three doctors, none of whom provide abortions, and their focus was on the conscientious objection rule in Ontario, which exempts doctors from having to perform procedures that conflict with their personal views and values. More on this later. But that was the extent to my abortion curriculum at medical school. So, You've probably noticed through this that there is a couple things missing from an abortion curriculum being taught to medical students who are Canada's future doctors and healthcare providers and hopefully future abortion providers. And I'll keep reiterating the fact that this is a quarter of a century after the 1988 Morgan Teller decision. So, um, for example, some of the things we're missing. How common is this procedure? How likely are we to see a patient at some point in our career who wants an abortion? What are the risks associated with this procedure? And by that I mean the real risks, not the ones that the media would have you believe. How can I provide safe, evidence-based care to a patient seeking an abortion? Yes, not all of us in medical school are going to become abortion providers, but not all of us are going to become cardiologists either, and yet we still had to spend hours on end learning how to read ECGs, hours which I will never get back in my entire life. <laughs> If it weren't for my involvement with Medical Students for Choice, I would have had absolutely no exposure to abortion throughout medical school. Through MSFC, a group of students who were interested in this aspect of healthcare 
were able to spend a few days at abortion clinics in the city, sitting in on counseling sessions, as well as the, the procedures themselves. We also had the wonderful opportunity to meet with Dr. Scott, who fought alongside Dr. Morgan Toller, who graciously offers an annual visit to his clinic for interested medical students. It was with this group of motivated medical students that we started fighting for curriculum change at University of Toronto. After several hours of in-person discuss discussions, emails, letters written to faculty, and endless meetings, we finally received the news that as of September 2013, medical and epidemiological aspects of abortion was added to the University of Toronto Medical School curriculum. <laughs> Similar battles are still being fought by motivated medical stu students across the country. For example, after a 2008 study at the University of British Columbia showed that graduating doctors had dismal knowledge about abortion, <coughs> UBC introduced a new curriculum requiring all medical students uh, to spend a week in a women's health clinic learning about contraception, pregnancy options, and abortion counseling. Similar curriculum changes are being fought for in various medical schools across the country, Saskatchewan, Ottawa, and the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, just to name a few. Beyond the medical student level, doctors are also fighting for the inclusion of mandatory abortion training in obstetrics and gynecology residency programs across the country. Osgan residents who complete their training at such programs have been shown to be more supportive of abortion and also more likely to provide abortions as part of their practice. Well, you know. <laughs> it's amazing to me. It's still I, I'm still going to keep going back to this fact, but it was 2015. 27 years after the Morgan Teller decision, and abortion training isn't considered to be a given in obstetrics and gynecology programs, a specialty that is completely dedicated to women's health. Residents, in many programs, residents still have to seek out their own abortion training in order to attain this training during their residency program, which they don't tend to have that many extra hours to on their time. The 1988 Morgan Teller decision was a pivotal point for women's reproductive, reproductive rights in Canada, but obviously the fight did not end there. Access to abortion continues to be limited in rural and remote regions of Canada. Even in major cities, access to women's health care remains questionable, and not just to abortion. I'm sure many of you remember the group of doctors in Ottawa last year who gained media attention for their refusal to prescribe contraceptives. Even here in Toronto, there are doctors who won't prescribe birth control, citing the conscientious objection clause, which I uh, previously mentioned. And only recently, uh, this clause underwent some changes. In March 2015, so earlier this month, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario updated its human rights policy due to complaints of access to care, which were mainly surrounding access to care for contraception and abortion. Under this new policy, doctors still do not have to provide services which conflict with their personal values and beliefs. However, the difference is, now there is an explicit mention of the need to refer such patients in a timely manner to a physician who is willing to provide the care that the patient requires. Physicians who don't, require, physicians who don't refer the patients in a timely manner will face disciplinary action. Soon after this update was announced, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan announced they would be making similar updates to their policies, and activists are working nationwide to promote similar changes in their own provinces. While there are still many details to work through in terms of how to implement this policy, this is an enormous step in the right direction in improving access to reproductive health services in the province, and would not have been possible without the concerted efforts of activists constantly lobbying for change. The closure of the Morgan Tyler Clinic in, Fre in Fre Fre Fredericton in to July of 2014 sparked outrage across the country. The results of this campaign, though, was, were outstanding. With the immensely su successful fundraising campaign that was run by the Reproductive Justice New Brunswick and the Fredericton Youth Feminist, a new clinic was able to open just this year in place of the old Morgan Tyler Clinic. Not only does this cl clinic provide abortions, provides women with comprehensive sexual care, including contraception, prenatal care, and pregnancy options. In addition to fundraising for the opening of this clinic, pro-choice activists came out in droves, protesting the provincial laws in New Brunswick, 
which require women to have two doctors approve of her abortion in order to have the procedure done in hospital, which harkens back to therapeutic abortion uh, committees, which Carolyn was mentioning, which were in existence before 1988. In order to get, and the reason why women would need the two doctor approval to get it, the abortion in the hospital was that only abortions in the hospital are actually publicly funded in New Brunswick. The huge amount of attention garnered by this campaign at the same time as the provincial election motivated politicians to finally review and bring to an end the archaic two doctors rule. There are still many issues with access to service and many issues with the abortion policy, the funding policy in New Brunswick still going on and still need to be fought. But this, we can take pride in knowing that the pro-choice movement is still strong and has been able to promote major changes with respect to access and will continue to do so in the future. During my time in medical school, I've been part of and witnessed many changes to reproductive health across the country. Many might believe that the need for pro-choice and feminism activism ended with the Morgan Teller decision of 1988, or so I was told to believe that in my hometown where I grew up in little northern Ontario. My experiences have shown me completely otherwise. I've only focused on my work with um, abortion care and sexual health, but I've, also, I've had the opportunity to work with hand in hand with activists uh, across the country in my new position this year as the National Officer of Reproductive Health with the Canadian Federation of Medical Students. I've been working, I've been working with uh, various uh, medical student activists across the country who are interested in promoting all aspects of sexual and reproductive health education among medical students. Just to name a few of the things that they're focusing on, they, we focus on, they, there's some students out in uh, UBC who are creating a series of seminars to focus on human trafficking. Um, here in Toronto, as well as in Queens, we had some seminars that, uh, about sexuality and aging. There's several seminars focusing on uh, LGBTQ issues in healthcare as well, and this is just to name a few of the issues that many activists across the country are working to educate medical students on. We cannot say we're done fighting for choice until every single Canadian woman has equal access to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health, and this is unaffected by age, location, income, and ethnicity, and this is the belief that many of the activists that I'm working with today still subscribe to. As I'm finishing medical school now, I'm excited to be dedicating my future career to furthering women's health by pursuing a residency training in obstetrics and gynecology. I look forward to my continued work with women's health advocates like yourselves. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity.